Hi, my name is Ian Kinder with Live Safe Academy. Welcome to the Live Safe Academy show. We have a very powerful show for you here today because I have a guest who's going to share a personal experience where somebody tried to abduct them at gunpoint when they were a teen. And of course, this is not only a worst case scenario for a teen, but it's also a worst case scenario for a parent. And we're going to talk about what happened so people understand what these situations look like. And then we're going to talk about how can you stay out of those situations? What can you do if you're in those situations? And then we're going to talk about what should you do after an event like this happens. If you feel this show is helpful, you can help us help you and other people too with a couple very simple steps. If you're watching this video on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like the video, hit the bell, share the video with other people. If you're listening to our podcast, subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast, share the podcast with other people. Then go to the video description or the podcast description where you're going to always see information there that's relevant to whatever is being discussed in the show. And you're also going to see a link, livesafeacademy.com forward slash connect. And when you go there, you will have access to all of our podcasts, our videos, our articles, our in-person classes in the Detroit, Michigan area, and our live virtual programs that you can participate in from anywhere in the world. So we're going to start today's show by getting a little bit of background about our guest here today. And then once we do that, we're going to jump into the event of what happened to him. And then we're going to kind of break this down, both from the teenager perspective and the parent perspective. How can we stay out of these situations? What should we do if we're in these situations? And what should we do if we're in these situations immediately after the event happens? So Norris, thank you very much for being a guest on this show. Can you give us a little bit about your background? And then once you do that, we'll kind of move on to the next step of talking about the event itself and then the lessons that we can learn from that event. And let me start by thanking you, sir, for having the willingness to come out here, share your experience with other people so that you can help them be, be more safe. Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I'm all about helping out, throwing my hat in the ring uh, whenever I can for, you know, a good cause, worthy cause. And definitely, you know, what you're doing and presenting is a good cause. Um, so a little bit about me and my background. I have a military background, a Marine Corps to be exact. Um, I owned, I once owned a private security company. And uh, I actually work for a private security company. And when I owned my company, I only took what I refer to as high risk accounts. So um, PPOs, you know, with whoever we were serving, having, you know, records or being on record for being, you know, violent or volatile, that kind of thing. Um, we we used to provide security for uh, movie companies when they would come into Detroit. Um, site security, if you will. Um, I have a uh, martial arts background. You know, I feel that, feel that to be relevant pertaining to the conversation we're going to have today. Um, I've been involved in martial arts and currently since I was 19. Um, now I'm 50 now, so <laughs> you fill in the blanks as far as time lapse, time span. Um, I'm a firearms instructor. Uh, to include uh, that as a part of my background, hands-on or what have you. So um, in short, I've been involved in the combative training industry, um, both as a, an instructor, a participant, along with my military background. Um, and I don't wanna leave out that I have been tapped, we've been tapped over the years to uh, help train uh, various local SWAT agencies, um, both from a veteran perspective and a civilian perspective. Um, fun times, fun times with that. But uh, just just a quick backdrop or backstory to me and, you know, how I feel what I'm getting ready to relay or share um, is solid as far as what I know, what I do, and what I've done, and why I'm here. 
Yeah, and, and that's why I wanted you to share your background, because when we break down the analysis of this and kind of give lessons for people to come away with, your background is really going to help with that. So thank you, thank you for sharing it. Now, let's talk about this experience yourself and just give a little bit of background to the people who are either watching this video or listening to this podcast. You grew up at the same time that I grew up during the, the I think you were born in the 70s, if I remember correctly. Yeah, right? 1970 to be exact. Yeah, that's the same year I was born, 1970. You grew up on the west side of Detroit. I grew up on the east side of Detroit, either in the city of Detroit or, uh, you know, around the city of Detroit in the suburbs. I spent time in very poor areas with my mom, but then I also spent time with my grandparents who were upper middle class. So I was not always in the city. But so I was up in and around the city. And that was back in the day when Detroit was the murder capital of the country. And, you know, you're going to talk here about being in a party store. And like we talked about the other day when we had a conversation about this, party stores, gas stations and Coney Islands were the front line of a lot of the craziness of what you have to deal with, especially back then during the 80s when this experience happened. And, you know, Detroit back then was the Wild West. There was a lot of craziness that you had to deal with. You mentioned, you know, crack was was starting to, to come out then. And, you know, crime was at, at an all-time high. And we, you were living on the front lines of that. And there were no support systems to help us deal with that. And people are going to kind of get a picture when you describe things on just what it was like to grow up in this type of environment. So let me kind of kick it back to you and talk a, a little bit about the experience itself and give us just a little bit of a backdrop of what it was like being in the city at that time. Yeah, man, um, you're exactly right. It was wild. It was wild. Um, but what's, what's funny is when you're in it, you don't really think about it per se. I mean, you see and you know stuff is going on around you and, you know, the visual effects are there, but you're not really soaking it in you know it's more of a hindsight kind of thing like we sit here now today reminiscing about what it was like back then and yeah you know now you know me and you're like damn and shit was wild i mean wild <laughs> would make for any any good hollywood movie today or series um so the landscape i grew up in was just like you described um i actually i graduated from uh detroit central on the west side Linwood and uh, Tuxedo, that whole area, that whole area was 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 just it was out of control. Um, but I'll get to the actual uh, event that I'm here to share. Uh, I worked at a neighborhood party store, and as you can imagine, like we just talked about, it was ground zero zero for a lot of off the wall things. And actually, this store was relatively new when I started working there. Like they didn't even have um, freezers put in yet for, for ice cream and, and um, yogurt or whatever. So get to the, the meat and potatoes of my uh, experience. Um, there was a customer that used to come in and, you know, right off the bat, you know, the first time I saw him, I knew something wasn't right, wasn't right with him. But to put it in perspective, he was just, you know, part of the landscape as far as being a native of, of the landscape. So um, from what I from what I remember and what and understand or understood, he had a he had a jail record and I think he was fresh out. Um, just that whole that whole thing, but he was a quiet kind of guy. So he wasn't like loud, boisterous coming in, causing problems every time he walked through the door. He was one of those, you like your you know, silent but deadly types or whatever. But anyway, he was all he would always call himself trying to lock eyes with me and, you know, giving me the thousand yards stare and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, at first I was put off by it, but then, you know, it became normal, I guess, simply because of the landscape. You know, you don't lock eyes with somebody that you you're not meaning to engage. So I actually, I didn't want no trouble with this guy because, you know, whatever. Back then, guns were like Skittles. Everybody had one, you know, except me. Um, and then the, the party store that I worked at, they they like to, to post up behind the plexiglass while I'm out on the floor, and they would use me to double as makeshift security slash stock boy. So I'm the only one out on the floor 
wide open for whatever. But, but getting, you know, getting to the actual event. So there's one particular night, the uh, the owner, um, he had me go outside and wait for a cab for him that he had called because he didn't drive. Um, so I'm outside and this guy, he obviously scoped the uh, the patterns and he knew when to pop up and, and try to do his thing because um, you know, this store, like many stores and gas stations in, in the Detroit area, it had a history of, you know, I call it like a black market. Like back in the day, um, they used to buy food stamps off of people, stolen merchandise, you name it. Um, that was their thing. So this guy was right on board with all of that. So he pulls up this particular evening and um, he's got something to try to sell the, uh, the owner. So he's like, you know, tapping on the glass or door, or he was wanting me to be the go-between to, you know, initiate the transaction. So I tap on the window, you know, I do the motion, the, the universal motion of, hey, you know, this. so the owner, he's like, no, 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 I, I got to go. I don't have time. I don't have time, you know, doing this kind of thing. And I no, 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 no. Right. So my man, he's like, well, I got something that you might like. Okay. We'll get into red flags in hindsight later on in, in the conversation. So for whatever reasons, I followed this guy around the corner because he had parked around the corner. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's in the car, you know, just, just take a look in the car. So when he opened the, the passenger door, he disappears around to the driver's side, I realized, but he was so, so quick with it, he was like a shadow. So about this time, I realized that now nah, there's some bullshit getting ready to go down because you know, whatever, you know, you get that gut feeling. And then by the time I decided to start pulling back, that's when he runs back around the, uh, the rear end of the car, pulls the pistol and jams the pistol in my uh, sternum. All right. So he starts with, you know, get in the car, get in the car, you know? So I'm like, no, I ain't getting in the car, get in the car, get in the car. And we somehow, you know, doing, doing the, the dance of death, if you want to call it, we, we in the middle of the street with it. Now this was winter time, roughly about two, two o'clock in the morning. Nobody's out, no nothing in Detroit. Um, black ice everywhere. And I'll, I'll explain why that's relevant, you know, in a minute. So we're doing the dance, get in the car, get in the car. So then he decides to dial it up a bit and starts cracking me with the pistol. Wow. You know, oh shit, now the shit done took another turn. Still with the get in the car, get in the car. And he's steadily racking the slide. Um, and then when you talk about hindsight, no rounds were ejected or whatever, but just the, the theatrics of it. So get in the car, get in the car. We're doing the pistol, the pistol whip thing and doing the dance. So at one point I snatched away and then he grabbed me like right away. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get shot. That didn't happen. You know, he's steadily trying to, uh, you know, bulldog and you know, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. So we're doing the dance a little bit more. And then I snatch away again. And this time I'm in a full sprint. So again, what's going through my mind is, okay, I'm getting ready to catch one in the back. So to explain the black eye situation, I went down, boom, I slipped and went down on the knee. And I look back, because again, I'm waiting for, for shots to ring out and you know it is what it is. And I'm just another statistic from that period in time and location. So I look back while I'm on the, while I'm on the knee and I see him you know, doing the, the confused dance. You know? So he don't know whether to try to, try to give chase, whether to start pump, pumping rounds or to just jump in the car and bail. So he chose the latter, jumped in the car and bail. And I made my way back into the store, let the uh, owner know what went down. That didn't go anywhere because this guy was, uh, he had already gotten robbed and beat up in the store. So he was terrified of working there anyway. He was the actual owner's brother. So all he was concerned about was the cab and you know and not too long after that the cab showed up and he jumped in the cab and, and went on about his way now keep in mind i live in the neighborhood i'm like three or four blocks from the store so i had to walk home my man didn't offer me a ride to the crib he didn't offer me hey get in the cab with me and i'll drive you off for none of that you know and then we start talking about child labor laws and all that, but whatever, you know, stay on point here. So I had to walk home after all of that. And I don't know if this guy went and got reinforcements. I don't know if he's going to call himself and try to double back and finish the job. I don't know. But that's the event that took place. Um, time frame, we're talking like 1986. So I was uh, like 16 
And uh, this guy is a full grown man, you know, just to let that be known. And uh, the physical disparity was there. Okay. I mean, when you think about jailhouse type situation, okay, this guy looked like he was one of those that hung out on the pull up bars out in the yard. All right. And I'm just, I'm just being pole 16 year old. Yeah. You know, I'm starting to play sports and stuff, but, and then I didn't know nothing about soft targets, jabbing eyes or whatever. But even if I did, I wasn't training it enough for it to be second nature. So that's, you know, that's the layout of the event. That, that was great. You just laid out a lot of really important things here that, that I want to touch on. First of all, to give a little bit of context, talking about selling food stamps, so what happened back in the day, and this still happens with bridge cards now, uh, bridge cards being the credit card that, that, that you'd use to buy food with, is folks would sell food stamps for usually about half of what they were worth. And then what would happen is, you know, that's great for the person buying the food stamps because now they're paying half for their food. But then the person selling the food stamps is now getting cash, which is what they ultimately want, usually because they're buying drugs, but for whatever cash that someone might need. But yeah, that, that was w one of the things that went on back in the day that still goes on now just in, in a more updated format. But I, I do want to touch upon something. I don't want to get too far off track on this, but you said something that's really important that I, I want people to hear. For those of us who do dedicate ourselves to training, so we're not just learning simple skills that we can learn right now because we want to be able to defend ourselves, but we really don't have an interest in participating in ongoing training like, like I know you do and like I do. For those who do have an interest in ongoing training, here's something that's really worthwhile. In, in a home that I lived in, I don't have this in my current house, but I had a, a bunch of training things set up outside so that 365 days a year, I was training outside in all conditions. And I know you, you do this now. And that's really important, especially here in Michigan, because you have all four seasons in like every four days. But the idea is you really learn a lot when you're training outdoors, what the environment, what in effect the environment will have on you when you're outside like as an example slipping on ice i was in a fight where i ended up uh s slipping on ice and slammed my knees in the ground and actually ended up losing that fight because i i could never get the momentum back after i slipped on the ice and i i couldn't get get back to my feet one of the officers that i trained ended up in some pay time off because he injured his knee when he was trying to restrain somebody and slipped and slammed his knee on, on the concrete. And I had a buddy of mine who right after he was in the shooting successfully defended himself, but as he was backing up, you know, almost fell on ice and they caught it on camera because it happened at a party store and I got to see the footage. But the point of that is, you know, people, I never hear people talking about training for those things, right? Yeah. They're, they're always training and like a floor and then that's it. But you really need to get outside, especially when you have all these different seasons to contend with as safely as possible. You know, safety is always first in training, but get an experience for what it's like to be on wet grass or what it's like to be on ice and snow and see how that affects the things that you in, 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 in intend to do. Because a lot of these things that people do in training really require a lot more balance than you're going to have depending on on the in the the environment that you're in. Heck, I was just training some uh, some of the cops that that I work with, and you know, just in the car and doing the, the normal stuff that you do when you're on patrol. And here we are in a situation dealing with somebody. We're all standing on ice, and if that would have gone physical, it would have been a very bad scenario. So what do you do? Well, if you're aware of it, you move off of the ice onto some place that you can stand to get some solid footing, so that if something bad happens, you're in a better position to respond. But you're never going to think about that unless you're training that or you're in the field dealing with it. So for those of you who do invest more time in your training than just a core set of skills, get outside and practice safely under different environments. So you're going to see how things like wet grass, snow, ice, and, and just being outside when it's raining and how that's going to affect your training. Because you're probably going to find that's going to filter out some of the things that you might be taking for granted when you're practicing. That's me as a trainer going off on a tangent. I apologize for that. I don't want to go on a tangent, but I think that's an important lesson. But what, what you just relayed there is really interesting. And of course, here you are, you're a teenager. You're dealing with a guy who's probably fresh out and dealing with convicts is that that's 
a lot to deal with, even if if, if you're a, a, a professional and, and you had to deal with them. Being a teen and just growing up in this environment, that really kind of helped paint a picture of, of, of what it was like to live in the city back then. We're talking about the uh, mid 80s here in the city of Detroit, in your case, on the west side. So let's talk about now that we've got that experience out for people, how can we prevent being in that situation in the first place? Because when I look at safety, I'm always thinking in the terms of prevention, primarily through awareness. And then of course, if we're in the situation, what are our best options? And then of course, what do we do immediately after the circumstance? So let's start from the ground up. Let's talk about prevention. He got you on the hook by offering you something that he knew you wanted so he can separate you and then have a chance to commit a crime against you. And then when he committed that crime, he did it with that disparity of force. Not only was he bigger than you and stronger than you because he's an adult, again, fresh out, which means he's probably been, been working out a lot and you're a teen, so he's got that advantage over you. But of course, he's got a weapon too. So let's talk about just how can we avoid being you know, what are the warning signs to recognize we're in the situation so that we can prevent being in the situation? Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, to sound cliche-ish, and I'm not saying that to, you know, minimalize the, uh, the very real concept of, uh, you know, paying attention to your surroundings, but um, I think the number one thing, you know, again, you know, we're talking about hindsight, is the fact that okay all of a sudden this guy wants to start trying to have a whole conversation with me you know um out of the blue per se but prior to that it was this stone-faced thousand yard stare kind of thing where he wouldn't utter two words to me all right so that should have been a red flag for me you know you know out the gate but me being you know young and dumb, I guess, as we all are or were once upon a time, I thought I took that as, okay, maybe he's not what I think he is because he's talking to me now. And that was a mistake. All right. When he started with that, I should have been like, no, the boss man don't want to be bothered with you. And I ain't got nothing for you. And I should have made my way back into the store because again, I don't know, this was winter time. So I don't know what he got on him. I, I sure didn't have anything on me that would have been, you know, of, of, you know, substance or great effect, i.e. a pistol. Um, and then again, come to find out, yeah, he had a pistol on him because here we are doing the dance with the pistol as, as the, uh, the host. So um, situational awareness can't be hammered enough. You know, some people glaze over, yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that, until you find yourself in a position where you didn't bother to enact that. So, don't blow stuff off. I mean, you know, yeah, you've heard it a thousand times, but then it'll, it'll come that thousand and, and first time where, okay, you've heard it all these times up till now. Why are you in this predicament? So, pay, you know, uh, as they say, the devil is in the details. So pay attention to the little things because it's the little things that morph into the big thing. So the number one thing, you know, thinking back as we're talking and holding this conversation was, I should have shut him down out the gate, all right? You ain't never had nothing to say to me, the, you know, two or 300 times that I've seen you come into the store. It was all this, it was always this standoffish kind of, you know, floating around like a vampire, you know, doing the eyeball thing, you know, the Bella Lugosi, Bella Lugosi uh, crazy vampire eyes, that, that type of stuff. And now all of a sudden here you are trying to hold conversations with me about something that I, initially didn't have any interest in all right i'm out here trying to flag a cab for the boss so i can go home so he can go home so i think that's that's paramount pay attention like i just said you know the devil's in the details and pay attention to the little things don't ignore stuff um and then that ties in with you know your gut feeling um there's a book that i suggest every time i have conversations like this the gift of fear and uh, it's a good read it's a good read and i i would advise you parents, teenagers, or whatever, to put that, make that a part of your library, podcasts, actual paperback, whatever. It's a good book. It's a good read. Um, so that's my uh, explanation on how I, I fumbled, as we all do. So 
I'm not relaying anything like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm down on myself because the bottom line, I'm here to share the story. So I came out on top, regardless of the, the, the inner workings of the interaction as to how I'm on the other side of all of this. Here I sit talking to you and everybody. Yeah, for sure. And of course, you know, you're a teen back then, you know, it's not like you're, you were an adult where now you have the life experiences and the training where you wouldn't fall for that now, but you were a teen then. And by you being willing and open to share this, now other people can hear this and, and they can learn too. Because, you know, I say the best way to learn through experience, the best way to learn is through experience. And the best experiences to learn through are somebody else's, right? Because if we can learn from their mistakes, and I've made plenty of mistakes too, right? Then, then that can help prepare people so they don't make the same mistakes that we made or that other people made. And that's why I'm so grateful for you being on the show. Let me mention a couple of things. So let's look at the math of what we're dealing with here. First thing is when people approach you, they want to put you at ease and make you feel comfortable so they can influence you, which often means to separate you to a location where they can commit their crime. You know, I always hear people say, don't let them get that close. If I followed you around all day and you're out in the public, you are getting close enough to people so they can commit crimes against you, period. That's just how it is. So it is true that we should, in fact, be aware of our surroundings and try to position ourselves in our environment so we're less likely to get caught off guard. And we have more time to respond to something if something bad happens. That's absolutely true. But it's also naive to say that we're just not going to let them get that close because people aren't going to identify themselves as a threat from 21 feet away. Hey, I'm coming over there and I'm going to rob you or abduct you or whatever. That's just not how it happens. So when I'm dealing with my kids in my kids class, one of the things I'll say is, look, if a bad person wants to hurt you, they're not going to jump out of a car wearing a big black hat and a big black cape and go, I'm a bad person. I'm here to hurt you because people know the kids are just going to run away and call for help. So if a bad person wants to hurt you, they're going to try to look like someone that you trust. They're going to try to make you feel comfortable. They're going to try to, you know, be somebody that, that, that you want to spend time with for whatever reason, because that's how they're going to trick you to get close enough to hurt you. So the first thing we start with is the undue attention. Why is this person paying attention to me in the first place? What is their ulterior motive? And one of the things that I tell kids is that it's never appropriate for an adult stranger to talk to a kid who's not being supervised. So in, in the case of a teen, of course, we have a little bit more flexibility there. You're working there. This could potentially be a customer or somebody who wants to sell thing. But just for the parents who are listening to this, one thing to tell your kids is adult strangers should never try to talk to them when they're not being supervised. That's number one. And then the other thing that we need kids need to understand is that an adult stranger never needs the help of a kid. If an adult stranger needs help, they're going to ask another adult. They're not going to ask a kid for help. That should automatically put up their, their, um, their warning flags to say, hey, this isn't right. So a couple of different things with that. Also, never let yourself get relocated because the overwhelming probability is that if you allow yourself to get relocated, like in this case, Norris, if you would have gone into the car, the overwhelming probability that, that you're going to die is, is extremely high the overwhelming probability is that you're going to die. So you never want to let yourself get relocated. That's a situation where you're going to do exactly what you did, which is fight or flee to your last breath. Never let yourself get relocated. Even if you reach that magical point where resisting means dying, die where you're at. Do not die where they want to take you because the death where you're at is going to be better than the death where, where they're going to take you. So we never let ourselves get relocated. And, you know, that means in part, don't let them take us somewhere else where they can have a greater ability to commit a crime against us. But it also means if they say go into that building, go into those bushes, get into that vehicle, just know if you do, the overwhelming probability is that you're going to die. And in that situation, you should never submit. You should always fight or flee to your last breath. So awareness is a really big part of this. And of course, never letting yourself get re relocated is a very big part of this too. Now let's talk about when you're in the situation itself, both for teens, God forbid they're in that situation, or for parents talking to their teens, what can we convey to them so that if they're in that situation, they'll understand what it is that they need to uh, do? Um, 
So first and foremost, and again, you know, another scenario that I don't want to trivialize. Um, so I hope it comes, I hope I convey it with the, with the seriousness and the gravity that it requires is a state of mind. Um, so we hear that a lot, state of mind, state of mind, you know, the will to preserve. Uh, I'll tell you that night, no matter what, I wasn't getting in that car. Simple as that. Um, I can't speak for somebody else. I can't sit here and say, well, somebody else might've just gotten the car and it's now. I don't know. I can only hold conversations about what I know and what I've been through as far as what we're talking about. So I knew for a fact I wasn't getting in the car. Never mind him with the pistol and, you know, uh, cracking me upside the head and all of that and me doing the dance and whatever. And again, you know, hindsight is 2020. The guy didn't even have, uh, he didn't even have bullets in the gun for as many times as he racked the slide, but you don't know that. I didn't know that, okay? It's nighttime. I'm being, you know, uh, bushwhacked, basically. So I'm not looking at the gun per se. You know, I'm looking at the whole deal. Um, so state of mind and the will to survive or persevere is, is uh, paramount because bottom, you know, all I could, all I remember looking at as far as what stood out, aside from this guy in my face, was uh, the, the, the passenger door was still open. So he hadn't popped the trunk or nothing like that. You know, I guess his plan was to try to stuff me in the, stuff me in the passenger side, but it's like, okay, we're talking mid eighties. So the whole, you know, when you drive off with the, when you put the car in drive and the doors automatically locked, that wasn't a, a common thing in vehicles back then. So, you know, you know, you're talking about hindsight being 2020, he didn't think that if I if he, if he somehow got me in the car in the passenger seat, he still would have to run around or whatever, climb over me to get to the driver's side to, to drive off with me. The doors didn't automatically lock when you put it in drive. I forget what kind of car it was. So he didn't think that I was just going to pull up the lock and, and bail and do, do a Colt Seavers, a, a stuntman, uh, roll out the passenger side or whatever. But, you know, that's just, you know, a, a nugget or whatever. It's not, not relevant. It is relevant per se, as far as that whole situation. But um, the one and only thing, you know, skills, skill set aside or lack thereof, the one, the one thing that trumped all of that, you know, skills, no skills, martial arts, sports, whatever, was the fact that I had it in my mind that I wasn't going anywhere. You ain't putting me in the car. Okay, and if that does happen, you'll be you'll be loading my either limp or dead body into the car. But I was not going to willingly get in the car, put on the seatbelt, and turn on the radio and let's go for a cruise. So you know, to to answer your question, uh, presence of mind, state of mind, you know, knowing what you don't want, what you're not going to go for, and what you're not going to allow to happen, is uh, is a big one. You know, skill set aside, because. Adrenaline is a head, is a hell of a thing. Okay, um, can't stress that enough. Even with, because I like, you know, like I stated earlier, you know, I've done, I've done security thing. As a matter of fact, I cut my teeth on a, what I like to call a local roadhouse. I don't even think that club is in business anymore. But if you ever saw the movie Roadhouse, it was all of that: pool cues, uh, champagne bottles, you know, and that was just to get the night going. We're not even talking about when it was time to close and get people out of there and be on our way. Guns coming out, laser beams, the whole, the whole shit, the whole bit. So even with that crew that I work with, and we train tactics and this and that, but if we were dealing with somebody and we have we we dealt with people on drugs, okay, whatever they were on, um, for a large part of that physical interaction. Skills didn't kick in until we had the situation under control, if that makes any sense. So we're dealing with a wild, a wild man. And yeah, we can do locks and joints and this and that, but he ain't feeling that because he's drunk, high, combination air up, right? So we would do the brute force thing to get it going, to dump him on his head, to wrap him up or whatever. And then the skills would kick in. So I'm saying all of that to say that state of mind coupled with adrenaline 
are, you know, your two most powerful, uh, you know, tools that you have at your disposal. And then, of course, everything after that, skills, experience, and dealing with people on a physical level, that kind of thing. But at that point, during that interaction, those are my those were my two saving grace. I knew what I didn't want, which was to allow this guy to try to take something from me that he didn't give me, which was my life. And number two, I wasn't going to sign into sign on to the platform that he chose to try to take something from me that he didn't give me, which was my life, trying to stuff me in a car and, as you say, relocate me somewhere. Yeah, those, those are great. So let me back up just a little bit and, and kind of build on what I talked about with prevention and awareness, because awareness is the key to prevention and prevention is the key to safety, because the only guarantee of safety is prevention. Every situation we avoid is a situation that we win. The best way not to be there on the back end is not to be there on the front end. So when we talk about prevention, we always want to be aware of our surroundings and make smart choices that help keep us out of danger before danger happens. If you get the sense that something's wrong, and, and you mentioned that where you got the sense that something's wrong, you really want to pay attention to that because those early warning signs, and I'm saying this to the audience because we, we already know this as adults, but the early warning signs are usually the best opportunity that we have to either avoid that situation or to be prepared if avoidance is impossible. So when you get the sense that something's wrong, you want to raise up in those levels of awareness and immediately think in terms of both prevention and preparation. How can I avoid this situation? How can it be mentally and physically prepared to respond if avoidance is impossible? And we don't want to overreact or underreact. We want to take into account both possibilities that it is dangerous and that it's not dangerous. So for me, as an example, let's just say I was walking out to my car and see a bunch of people that are loitering around my car. Well, I can think to myself, they might be there to rob me. They might be there to take my car, eh, but they're probably just there talking. If I pull out my pepper spray and hose them all down, well, I'm going to be the one who gets in trouble because I overreacted. But at the same time, if I ignore them, like they're not there to hurt me, now I can end up in a situation that I could have avoided. I can end up getting caught off guard when I could have been prepared. So in my case, I'm going to walk past them like it's not my car. I'm going to get to a safe distance and I'm going to monitor them from a distance. They probably are just talking, which means they probably are just going to walk away in a couple of minutes and it's no big deal. I didn't overreact, I didn't underreact. I took into account both possibilities that it is dangerous, that it's not dangerous, but I raised up in my levels of awareness and I thought in terms of prevention and preparation, how can I avoid this situation if it's dangerous? How can it be mentally and physically prepared to respond if avoidance is impossible? So that awareness is a really critical step in staying out of these situations before they happen and prevention is the key to safety because it's the only guarantee of safety and awareness is the key to prevention. So that's one aspect of it. Now, the other thing I'm gonna put out there to build on, on the points that you're making is mindset. Anytime we're involved in a violent situation, there are always circumstances beyond our control or we wouldn't be involved in that situation in the first place. But other things that we can control, mindset is gonna have the greatest impact on the outcome. So if you think about it, if you're in a life and death situation, you got nothing to lose by fighting back to your last breath, right? Because losing can mean dying. So it doesn't matter how scared we are. doesn't matter how isolated we are from help. doesn't matter how outnumbered we are. doesn't matter how many times we've been shot, stabbed, or hit. If losing can mean dying, then we have nothing to lose by fighting back to our last breath. Even again, if we meet, reach that magical point, we say, you know what? I don't think I'm going to make it out of this situation, but I'm taking somebody with me because Norris, as you pointed out, and I'm talking here to the audience, I'm not talking to you, I'm reiterating points, but to build on what you said, it's not their life to take, which means you're going to make them pay the highest price that you can. And God forbid, we can't stop them from hurting us at least we can stop them from hurting anybody else in the future. And that's a pretty easy thing to understand if we're all just sitting here comfortable, right? Listen to a podcast or watching a video. Oh yeah, that's what I'll do. But if I was to take your average student, have them run five flights of stairs as fast as they can, knowing that there's a fully padded instructor at the top, you know, we're in that padded suit, we can hit somebody full force and not hurt them. And that instructor is going to beat you unconscious if you don't beat them to the ground first. And again, Norris, I'm talking to the audience here. I'm, I'm not talking to, to, to you directly. But 
and, and by the way, to the audience, we don't actually do this with students. Okay, this is just an example. It's a hypothetical. But it, if we did do that, most people would make it about halfway up those flights of stairs. They'd be gasping desperately for air. Their heart would be pounding. Their lungs would be burning. They'd probably feel nauseous like they're going to vomit. And then they're going to ask themselves two questions. Can I do it? And is it worth it? Well, the answer to both of those questions has to be yes. But that doesn't happen automatically. We have to train ourselves to think that way. So if people go out to our website, livesafeacademy.com, we have a page for online resources. And under additional resources, we have a video by a TV show called Justice Files. And they interview somebody named Lance Thomas. Now, I know you're familiar with him, Norris, but a lot of the audience might not be. Lance Thomas is an individual who had a watch shop in an area of LA where there's a lot of increase in gang violence. And as a result of that increase in gang violence, he got into four shootings. Always a lawful defender, and he won all four gunfights. But in two of these gunfights, he was shot in the throat. Let me say that again. He won all four gunfights, all four gunfights. But in two of the gunfights, he was shot in the throat. So we're poor asking, hey, you're shot in the throat. How come you didn't give up? And Lance says, well, I wasn't dead yet, and I wasn't out of ammunition. And that's the type of mindset that we have to have, that no matter what happens, that we're going to be the one breathing when that situation is over. And I'm certainly not here to go on the horror stories, but I can tell you, I have been to countless scenes where people have cooperated with the criminals who murdered them and who have allowed themselves to be relocated by those criminals. You do not want to be that body. So you never, under any circumstance, allow yourself to be relocated, and if God forbid you have to defend yourself, you must make the mental emotional connection that I'm gonna do whatever it takes to shut this threat down, to stop them from hurting me, that I am gonna be the one breathing when this situation is over. And the last thing I wanna mention here, and then I wanna kick it back to you, and we're gonna talk about some lessons that we can convey for people who are in those situations, what can they do after the fact, but let me just talk about some real simple self-defense, some concepts that everybody can keep with them to save their life if God forbid they're in this situation. Now, we do have our in-person classes here in the Detroit, Michigan area. Our school does travel if you want to bring us to you. And we do have our live virtual programs that people can participate in from anywhere in the world. And we'll have that information in the video description and in the podcast description, including a one-hour self-defense class for kids and a two-hour self-defense class for adults, women, and teens. And in those classes, the goal is to learn very simple skills that you can use right now that will give you the best chance with minimal training to protect yourself under real circumstances. But that's not a commercial. I'm just letting people know if they want to build on their knowledge, those are really easy and effective ways you can do that. But let me give you concepts right now that can save your life. Number one, you are at a physical Norris. You are at a disadvantage to him because he was larger, faster, stronger than you. When people single you out there, and again, I'm talking to the audience here, not, not you, because you, you know this already, but to the audience, when people single you out, it's going to be because they have an advantage over you. You do not have to be larger, faster, stronger than the people you're defending yourself against to successfully defend yourself. And you see this over and over again in violent altercations. And there's a couple different reasons why. First of all, if they singled you out, well, most criminals, they're not looking for a fight. They're looking for a victim, which means if they single you out, it's probably with the expectation that you're not going to fight back, which means if you choose to fight back, you're probably going to have the element of surprise because they're not expecting you to fight back, which means if you choose to fight back, if you have the element of surprise and you're aggressive and decisive, that can be what saves your life. Having the element of surprise, because they're not expecting you to fight back, that's why they singled you out. And if you're aggressive and decisive, that can be what saves your life. That can help you overcome that advantage that they have over you. But here's what we want to understand. If we have to use force, the best way to disrupt the body is to disrupt the brain. And I don't care how bigger they are than you physically, how much stronger they are than you. The reality is we all weigh enough to drive our body weight through the brain and disrupt the brain so we disrupt the body. So even if I get a kid in my self-defense class, he weighs 70 pounds. If I put him on a rope swing and I have him swing full force and hit another person, it's going to hit him hard. 
That 70 pounds hits hard. And especially if you hit somebody in the head, very good chance you can knock them out. It's only 70 pounds. But the point is, if we use our body weight and drive that body weight through the head, we can disrupt the brain and that disrupts the body. Better than that is if we can grab a dense, blunt object that we can hit them in the head with so we can disrupt the brain to disrupt the body, which then creates the window of opportunity for us to solve that problem and get to safety. But the other thing is attacking the eyes. Because as quickly as possible, we need to shift our focus from, oh, my God, what's going to happen to me to what am I going to do to them? And we have to shift their focus from trying to hurt us to trying to protect themselves. Because the reality is nobody's made out of magic. Everybody breaks, bleeds, and dies, and everybody can lose. You could be a Navy SEAL with 10 years of combat experience, and a crackhead can still kill you. If they're focused on hurting you, you're at risk for getting hurt. But if they're focused on protecting themselves, they're not trying to hurt you. Well, one of the most reliable ways that we can cause a rapid shift in focus is to attack the eyes by taking our thumb or our fingers and a driving, them, driving them aggressively into the eyes so that they stop trying to hurt you, they start trying to protect their eyes, and that can create that window of opportunity for you to solve that problem and to get to safety. Better than you using your thumb or your fingers is to have an object that you can drive into the eyes. When my son reached a certain age, I did not let him leave the house without a pen. Because God forbid, if somebody was trying to take him to a vehicle, I would much rather have him stabbing his way out of that situation than hit him, hitting his way out of that situation. Well, a pen is not perceived as a weapon. It's an unrestricted item. You can take it with you anywhere you go, and minors can have it too. And go on airplanes with it going to court buildings with it because it's not perceived as a weapon. You could have it in your hand as you're pumping gas or walking to and from your car. And God forbid you got to defend yourself. What's the fastest weapon you can deploy? The one that's already in your hand. So as long as your your minor child, I'm talking to the parents right now, is responsible enough that you can trust them with carrying a pen in self-defense, you can help them understand that a pen, particularly to the eyes, is a very effective way to stop something from hurting you. Now, when we talk about attacking the eyes, especially with an object, I only recommend you do this to stop an imminent threat of death, great bodily harm, or sexual assault to an innocent person. If it's not that level of threat, we don't want to escalate to those kind of force methods. But if it is that level of threat, these are the force methods that can help save our life, even with very little training. So using blunt force with your body or with an object to the brain with as much body weight as you can, so you're not depending on physical strength, but using the weight of your body can be a very good way to disrupt the brain, to disrupt the body, so you have a chance to get away. Attacking the eyes with your fingers, your thumb, or better yet, an object, if your life is in danger, so that you can then shift their focus from trying to hurt you to try to protect their eyes, so you have that window of opportunity to get to safety. Those are all things that could save your life just from us having this conversation in this video, so you understand what to focus on to create that chance to get away. Because the goal is always to get away as quickly as you can. Because the longer you're in that situation, the worse it is for you, the more likely the situation is gonna escalate, the more likely that you'll become injured or exhausted. You're not safe until you separate from the threat and get to a safe place. And we wanna do that as quickly as possible. And any force that we use, we're using specifically to create that chance to get away. So that takes us to the next step here, Norris. Once they get to safety, how do we deal with this situation after the fact? Do we just kind of write it off and say, thank goodness, I'm all done with that? Or are there certain steps that, that we should take afterwards? Okay, so um, I actually have a, a two-sided answer for that. One, um, I'll relay what I actually did after that. And then two, um, I'll reiterate a point that you made early on when we were talking about, you know, how, how to deal with that effectively. Not to say that how I dealt with it wasn't effective. It was effective for me um, at the time, because, you know, my, here, here was my thought process. So no, I didn't call the cops or the cops were not called, even though 
I, you know, I told you all, I went to the store and told the owner what happened and called police and he, that didn't happen because his cab showed up or whatever. So I didn't follow up on that and call the cops myself because one, like you brought up earlier, um, the concept of, uh, you know, police in Detroit back in the 80s, you know, mid 80s, early 80s, especially was, uh, was, it was pretty dismal at best. So calling the cops would actually have compounded the situation um, for me. And then um, number two, going back to a point that I brought up, um, I had to live there. So I don't, I didn't know, which I'm sure he was, but I didn't know how, how dug in this guy was as far as his associates or affiliates. Okay, let's pretend that I did the, you know, the right, the so-called right thing. And I called the cops and filed a report and they, they found him, picked him up and that whole bit. Okay. I don't know what kind of circles he was running in. I, I have an idea. Okay. So now I'm set. Now my thought process is I'm setting myself up for retribution, you know, not from him directly, but, but through his associates representing him. So my thought process was 100% based in personal protection and not naivete. Okay, because uh, I just remember this phrase that was uh, relayed to a group I was with when I was in a junior college getting my uh, criminal justice degree. And uh, this one class that I was taking, I forget the name of it. It might have been criminal investigations or something like that. But um, we took a field trip to the morgue, the one downtown, the new one, or the newer one. And, um, you know, before the guy took us on a tour, uh, you know, he was like, um, you know, first of all, you know, he read off the name, you know, he dropped the disclaimer of, okay, before we, before we get going, I'm gonna read off names. And if anybody knows these names or has, has any kind of affiliation with these names that I re read off, you know, I'm gonna have to pull you to the side and you may not be able to be a part of this, this tour. And the names he was talking about reading off were the guests of honor and, and more. So he read off the names, nobody raised their hand. And then he gave us, uh, he just, he dropped, you know, a, a, a quick line to us. You know, he's like, um, no matter what you do, you can wake up, you can do everything right and still wake up dead. So what that, what that means and what that translates to me is, yeah, I'm doing the right thing, checking all the boxes, but I'm, but in the interim, I'm, I'm putting myself at more risk. Um, and it wasn't me, you know, just sort of thinking and conjuring up stuff in my mind. I mean, that's how stuff was back then. You know, you call the cops and then, and then the cops show up and then something happens in the way of law enforcement intervention. Okay, well, guess, guess who all of that's going to fall back on if what's supposed to happen happens, which is this guy getting arrested, prosecuted, going back into the pokey or whatever. So my decision to not follow up with that the so-called right way was 100% rooted in self-preservation. And I dealt with it the way I dealt with it on my own related story to, you know, my buddies, you know, this kind of thing, but I didn't, I didn't invoke any kind of legal um, follow-up, if you will. Now today, not so much the case as far as Detroit police and, and the whole um, law enforcement apparatus here in Detroit, you know, it's a lot better than what it was back then. So if you do find yourself in a situation that I've relayed, follow up, follow up with, follow up with that. And here's a reason why, um, which, you know, Ian, you brought that up. Even if nothing happens in the way of instant gratification, bottom line, you got paid, you don't put paper on. So they're in the system. Or if they already are in the system, well, they got some new stuff on them in the system. So if or when something when they 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 say they decide to pull something else on somebody else down the line, okay, cop, prosecutor, however that works, they pull them up. Oh, okay, um, you just recently tried something, and you know, a, a criminal complaint was filed against you. You know, they're in the system, even if nothing actually happens, and your particular situation is not addressed, you know, to your liking or addressed at all. You got you. You put paper on them. 
And the saga continues as far as these individuals or this individual who, you know, feels that it's okay to roam the countryside victimizing people. And today, being, being in the system today, having paper on you today is, in my opinion, a thousand times worse than back in the day because there's so much tied to your driver's license today, your, your, your state ID. You can't even rent an apartment without legit ID or, or having a clean ID, driver's license or whatever, okay? So if nothing else, just keep in mind that there's so much tied to your ID today. Um, you, can't, you can't buy a pack of bubble gum legitimately if you got all kind of stuff hanging on your ID to include criminal complaints. Um, that stuff affects your credit. No, not that, you know, the kind of people we're talking about are worried about their credit or who knows. I mean, you know, um, derelict behavior is not relegated to financial standing per se. I mean, there's plenty of clean cut Taylor Soup criminals walking around out here and they got, you know, money longer than train smoke, but another topic for another day. Um, just the fact that you got that you put paper on somebody or you've kept the paper trail going on somebody um, is definitely better than nothing. And then obviously, you know, as far as your own, um, you know, personal way of dealing with the, the situation, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to sound canned or scripted or, you know, like everybody else, but to a certain degree, um, talking to folks that you trust, um, to be totally honest, what, what really helps is talking to somebody who's been through that kind of thing of what you're trying to relay and convey. Because, yeah, you know, you can do the professional, uh, you know, psychiatrist, psychiatrist, you can do all of that and they're trained in all of that and I'm not knocking that. But, you know, treat, you know, engage that with a grain of salt. I mean, yeah, it looks good. You're supposed to feel good, but I'll tell you just flat out, you know, talking to somebody sitting across, sitting across from you who they dealt with that. They, and then, and then better yet, they dealt with that more than once more, you know, more often than not, you know, being on the same page with somebody as opposed to somebody who's paid to listen to you. And then they have this script or this, 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 this layout of responses, you know, it's, it's two different worlds. And I say this because my, my current day job, I work in the mental health department, okay? And there are some, you know, mental health professionals who they just write out of a book, flat out. Everything come out of their mouth is scripted, it's plastic, you know, it's designed, you know, it's like topical feel good kind of stuff. And then I know some mental health professionals who like one in particular, he is a, um, SWAT negotiator. Yeah, so he, he's a clinical psychologist by day, right. and by night he uh, he's a SWAT negotiator. Okay, yeah. so I feel you know if I were relaying my experiences to you know a, a so-called mental health professional, I would definitely want to talk to a guy like that as opposed to somebody who's scripted. You know, they're plastic. They're just rattling off stuff that they've been trained to to rattle off, and then worse yet, you know slap a bottle of pills on you and tell you to come back in two weeks. Yeah, you're, you're making a, a lot of really good points. And I, I kind of want to build on, on some of these here real quick. So there's a, a couple different things here. First of all, when, you know, the criminal system, it, it, it's a mess. There's just, there's no way around it. And what a lot of people don't realize is prosecutors had this many problems and this many resources. And what they're trying to do is get the simplest solutions that they can with the least amount of resources possible. And that is a big difference than, than getting justice. So people have to be mentally prepared for that. But the other thing is, you know, like I, when I worked at a party store also in the eighties, I ended up pulling a shotgun out on a carjacker because I watched him carjack two girls in, in the parking lot. And I didn't catch him as I was coming out with the shotgun, he was pulling out of the parking lot. But the, uh, he ended up getting off, not because he wasn't caught, you know, red handed in it, the police caught him a mile away, and they arrested him. But the thing there was that his defense attorney kept delaying the case, delaying the case, delaying the case. Well, every time you, de you delay the case, you now got witnesses that got to take time out of their lives, maybe time off of school, maybe time out of work, 
and eventually you're not going to have any witnesses left. And that's how this guy walked just a tactic like that. So the justice system just has a lot of problems, but here's what I'm going to say to this. And I know you and I are in 100% in agreement on this. When a crime happens, you want to immediately call 911 and report the crime. And there's a lot of reasons why this is really important. I had one young girl, she's a college age student. She just took my self-defense class. It's a two hour class, just like the one that we teach in line, but this is our in-person version. And she said to me, hey, you know, four months ago, I was assaulted. I never said anything. What should I do now? And, you know, of course, I told her, you know, you, you should go report the crime. But the problem with that is four months later, what's the probability that she's going to get any justice out of that? Of course, it's just not very likely. And that creates now a couple of problems because one, she's not getting the justice that she deserves for what she had to go through. But remember, if somebody's trying to hurt you, they're probably not just trying to hurt you. And again, I'm talking to the audience here. They're not just trying to hurt you. They're out there trying to hurt other people too. And so we don't just want to stop them from hurting us. We want to disrupt their ability to hurt others too. And one of the ways we do that is to take them as far through the legal process as we can. So this person who hurt her is now out there hurting other people too, most likely. And I'm not blaming her for that because she didn't know any better. It's not about blame. But look at the lesson there. Had she reported the crime right away, had she known to do that, had somebody explained that to her, then not only was she more likely to get justice for what she had to go through, but now she would have maybe prevented that person from hurting someone else, even if only temporarily. And again, that's not the blamer because she didn't know, but we can learn from that. So what I always say to people is one of the reasons why we want to immediately report the crime is because they're probably initially not just trying to hurt you, they're trying to hurt other people too. And we want to do whatever we can to disrupt their ability to hurt others. And one of the ways we can do that is to take them as far through the legal process as possible. But again, anybody who has experience with the legal system knows it's by no means perfect. And what you're probably going to find is after you get victimized by the criminal, you're going to turn right around and get victimized by the legal system. But even if you don't get the justice out of that process that you want, as you said, Norris, you're still contributing to a process that might eventually interrupt their ability to hurt others, even if only temporarily. So I consider that kind of like a civic duty as much as you can take them as far through the legal process as possible. But the other thing is your number one weapon in the legal system is your credibility. And that's going to be really important if you're trying to get them you know, the prosecutor to prosecute them and get a successful conviction. But it's also really important if the prosecutor comes after you, which unfortunately happens sometimes too. So the sooner we make that 911 call, the more credibility we're going to have. And credibility is our number one weapon in the legal system. So again, the sooner we establish ourselves as a victim, the more credibility we have, credibility is a normal weapon in the legal system. That's going to be really important to get the prosecutor to choose to go after them and affect their ability to get a successful conviction. But it will also help protect you if the prosecutor decides to come after you. But I also want to talk about this mental health perspective because I think you bring that up is a really important point. Before I do that, I'm going to try a technological thing and I'm not technological. So we're going to see how this works. Best of luck. Let's hope here that I can pull this off. I just want to very briefly show people because we have a lot of free resources as a public service. And I think you can see our website here, livesafeacademy.com. And if you go to online resources, and this is what I referred to earlier, and this is why I want to bring this to everybody's attention, you will see additional resources. When you click there, you will see a lot of free resources that we have here for you guys that I highly encourage you to take time to go through, including that video by Lance Thomas, which is something that I really recommend everybody take time to listen and share with others, watch it and share it with other people, because it's a really great resource when it comes to winning, uh, having that winning mindset that we talked about. But the other thing is on our YouTube channel, Live Safe Academy, our YouTube channel, I have a video that I'll put in the video and podcast description of this show talking about the one self-defense skill that can save everybody, where I talk in detail about attacking the eyes, something I mentioned earlier, and where I also relate some firsthand experiences, one where I had to gout someone in the eyes 
back when I was in a boys home, but also an experience that I witnessed and also an experience that a trooper shared with me. Cause I think that skill is really something that everybody needs to know. Attacking the eyes can literally save, save your life. So I'm going to put that out there. And then we also have a video on our YouTube channel talking about how to call nine nine one one, which we need to understand how to do that correctly to get help to us as quickly as possible. Now that particular video, the one I currently have on my a YouTube channel at the time of filming this is directed towards teens because we teach a lot of teens too. But in that information, in that video is information that everybody needs to know about making a 911 call. And not everybody does know about making 911 calls. And I know that because some of my students work as 911 dispatchers and it's it can be very difficult for them to get the help that people need because they have to deal with this issue of them not knowing how to convey the proper information in the proper sequence during these 911 calls. So I'm definitely going to recommend those two videos to you guys in addition to going to our website and watching that video by Lance Thomas about winning mindset. But let me talk about this mental health issue. All physical confrontations are battles for control. And we need to get the control back as quickly as we can. Now, the most immediate sense of this is our physical safety stopping them from hurting us. But it doesn't stop there. It continues with the legal, the medical, and the emotional aftermath of that altercation. Because we do not want to let people control us any longer than necessary. So let's talk about this from the emotional point, point of view. Let's say that you are in a, a situation where you had to defend yourself. Let's say that you have a gun and you had to shoot somebody to stop them from killing you or another innocent person. And in that altercation, you ended up getting shot too. And now the police show up, EMS shows up, they take the bad guy with the bullet hole that you put in them, they drive them off to the hospital. And they got another ambulance right there for you. And they're like, hey, why don't you hop in? We'll take you to the professionals. We'll get that bullet hole taken care of for you. And you're like, nah, I'm just going to walk it off rub a little dirt on it, walk around the block a couple of times, I'll be fine. Nobody's going to do that, right? You, you, you have an injury, you're going to go to professionals that can help you with that injury. It's just common sense. Well, let's say you're struggling with the emotional aftermath of this situation. Are, are you going to walk it off? Or are you going to go to the professionals that can help you? So I really encourage people, if they're struggling with the emotional aftermath of this, to seek out the type of support that they need to get that control back. And that can manifest in a couple of really important ways. But Norris, you really hit on something that, that is critical that I want to build on and, and draw attention to what you pointed out. You want to deal with the professionals that have the experience of helping you with the specific type of problem that you're dealing with. If your knees hurt, you don't go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. You go to a knee doctor. They're both doctors but one is specializing in your problem. If you're struggling with the emotional aftermath of what happened to you, just like you pointed out, Norris, and we didn't talk about this ahead of time. This is just you sharing your experience because you, you're a knowledgeable person, but you hit on something that's important. Go to therapists that know how to help you with the problems that you're dealing with, like therapists that work with police and soldiers dealing with the emotional aftermath of using force because they will have the greatest experience to, to help you. You can go to clergy if you're a religious person and they can help you through these situations. You can go to support groups. And the other big thing that you talked about, Norris, is going to people either in your life or through support groups or however you do it that have been to the specific situations that they've been through because they're the ones who have the skin in the game. They're the ones who share your experiences. They're the ones that can help you walk through that process of getting that emotional control back. The very last thing I'm going to mention here. I actually work with my school, Live Safe Academy. We have a lot of therapists that send their, their um, clients to us. And the reason why they do that is because their clients have been through some type of uh, a violent altercation and they're struggling with the emotional aftermath of this. And a lot of times the big problem is when people get hurt, now they start to feel helpless and they're in fear of getting hurt again. So what we want to do is help them get that sense of control back. By putting them in self-defense situations, training scenarios, where as an example, we put on the padded suit and they can hit us full force, just like they would have to in a real situation. And, and keep in mind, nothing in training 
is the same as a real situation because no one's trying to hurt you on purpose. And we don't pretend that training is ever like a real altercation. But you can do a lot of things in training to simulate a real altercation without being reckless with people's safety. And you can do it in a way where you get a lot of the same stress responses and a lot of the same emotional responses. And then what you can do is you can rewrite history. You can do what you wanted to do in that situation and you can do it in the training scenario so that now you're, you start to feel that sense of empowerment that if this ever happens again, I can rewrite a different outcome. And that can help you gain that sense of control to give you that confidence of moving forward. Don't let people control you emotionally any more than you would let them control you physically. I think that's a really important thing to understand. I think these are situ these are aspects of personal safety that maybe a lot of times people, you know, may deal with the technique part of things, but they don't always deal with these other aspects, the legal aspects, the emotional aspects, the the physical uh, recovery, as well as all the pre-event things like the awareness, having a plan in place before you need it, avoiding altercations before they ever happen. This is all a total package of safety and sharing real life experiences like yours helps put all of this into context. So people see the big picture of what they're dealing with. Because here's one last thing I'm going to mention, and then I'm going to kick it back to you for final thoughts. What oftentimes happens when people think in terms of self-defense is they focus on the physical altercation. Maybe they focus on some of the warning signs that might happen before the physical altercation. But the reality is there's a full spectrum of what happens in a real situation that goes all the way from the initial contact and all the warning signs before the initial contact to going all the way through the legal, the medical and the emotional aftermath of that. It's where you have gaps in your mental preparation for that spectrum. It's where you have gaps that will normally cause you problems. Classic example, this is a 911 call. Everybody thinks about how they're gonna shoot somebody in self-defense. Not everybody, and now awareness is growing, but Norris, you and I have been doing this for a while, and now when one calls weren't even talked about, you know, at, at one point in training, that that's more of a newer thing in, in, the, in the training world. Mm -hmm. But then they get into a situation where they're dealing with police, they didn't plan for that, they didn't mentally plan for it. They're dealing with a 911 call, they didn't plan for that. They've got a civil defense and a criminal defense, they didn't plan for any of that, and that's where they have problems. So we want to plan for the full spectrum of events from those initial warning signs all the way through the legal, the emotional, and the medical aftermath of what we're dealing with. To frankly, beyond that, having your state in order so you have a will and all of the other things in place. So if God forbid you do lose your life, you make sure that all of your, your affairs are in order for, for anybody that is going to benefit from that experience in the sense that I have a son, so I have a trust. If I lose my life, I want to know that he's taken care of and he doesn't have to deal with the legal system of what is he going to do now with all this property and everything. I want to know that he's taken care of. So it really goes even to, if God forbid we lose our life, having our estate in order too. Full spectrum, we got to be prepared for the full spectrum where you have gaps in your preparation is where you have problems. So I don't want to keep going here because we want to keep things condensed. Um, but Norris, why don't you go ahead and just give us in a couple minutes some passing thoughts, and then I'm just going to wrap things up here for, for, for the audience. Okay. So uh, just a quick addendum to your, uh, your blurb about dealing with the cops and, and um, you know, having your, your mental faculties in order from, from beginning to end to include the, the, the interaction with law enforcement. So what you, what you have to keep in mind is when the cops show up, um, they're not there to, how shall I say, um, and then we're talking about after the thing has taken place and you've called them and they come and this and that. Okay, the whole concept of police is reactive not proactive. So when they when they come, they're not coming to rub and pet on you and this and that. I mean, they'll do that as far as a, you know, sort of a plastic scripted kind of thing, you know, comfort the victim or whatever, but no, they're there to build a case, okay? And if you haven't trained, you know, like if whatever course of 
combative training you engage in and you know really it should be a part of your life but whatever you know um but if the scenarios that you engaged in in a way of training especially any any kind of verbal training and the wrong thing falls out of your mouth to the cops you know these folks you're deeming as your saviors that's your ass mr postman okay now now as you said earlier you, now you're being victimized twice because again they're not there to rub and pet on you they're, they're there to build a case or to see if there's a case to be built okay and then the trickle effect off of that is they have bills to pay they have salaries they're trying to maintain prosecutors that whole machine that's really built on financial sovereignty or financial aspects that's what they're there for i mean you need to understand that so you know, if if you feel the need to, you know, again, in your 11th hour, you just want to let it all hang out and tell everything or whatever. Yeah, they'll listen. And OK, you lucked up and you got some cops there that are not just, you know, doing the robot thing and going by the book. You know, they're there to actually try to help you. OK, great. You won the lottery that day. That's not how it goes. It's not how it's laid out to go. OK, they're there to see if there's a case to be built, you know, on you or whatever. Really, it's on you because your, your, your nemesis is gone in the wind. So you're the sole representative of the, the situation. So just keep that in mind, you know, um, whatever kind of training you embark upon, make it full circle, all right? From physical stuff to, you know, mentality, how to talk. Like when I'm teaching my um, firearms classes, CPL classes, you know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, chapters in the um, NRA handbook, because I'm an NRA instructor, is how to talk to the police, both on the phone and in person. Okay, and you know if you feel like uh, you know you may if you feel like you're getting ready to incriminate yourself, you don't have to sit there and spill the beans. I'm not saying right away just start hollering for a lawyer. Okay, because yeah, you can do that, but then how does that look on you? But just just understand these things you know, while you're in your in your layer of comfort and you're not dealing with anything right now, you know, um, do, the, do the mental judo full circle, not just, oh, I wanna learn how to beat people up or I wanna learn how to shoot people. You know, A to Z, as far as your combative training regimen and or platform. So I'll, I'll get off of that. Um, so in, in closing, again, you know, I hope, the, you know, what I relate as far as an experience that is what, damn near 30 something years old. <laughs> I don't know, I'll break out a calculator, whatever. 2021 minus 1986, however many years that is. Uh, but I still remember the stuff like it was yesterday. Meaning that um, these things don't have a shelf life, you know, violence and, and, and the presentation thereof it, it don't they don't have a shelf life so the story i'm telling you from 30 years ago somebody's probably going through right right now as we sit here um take your personal protection seriously okay when you start slacking and you know you start signing on to mantras lazy mantras i call them oh well, yeah you know i i yeah i used to train that but i'm okay now I, you know any kind of flippant blow off mentality that you find yourself subscribing to via others, okay? You know, the bottom line with that, beware of experts, okay? And I'm not gonna tie up any more time with that, but I personally have a problem with that term because to me, it denotes or, or, or has the connotation of the buck stops here, I'm the expert. You can go, go no further. Nobody else knows nothing but me because I'm the expert, right? And you and I both, Ian, we've seen countless examples of so-called experts, you know, just being garbage, all right? Bottom line, self-titled experts. That's what I mean to convey. Or just that term, peer. beware. Beware of that term and people who use that term and, and they, they, they cling to that term and they just, you know, I'm the expert. I'm the, you know. Now, don't relinquish your, your gift of free thought or critical thought to anybody question everything and everybody okay never mind how somebody eats pay attention to how they are how they eat is the title they operate under 
how they are is who they are. Okay, because people don't change, they rearrange. So pay attention to who's presenting, them, presenting themselves to you as a so-called expert on subject matter and go from there. Don't just blindly sign on to stuff, okay? Because that's, that's a recipe for disaster within itself. I know because I've seen it, okay? And various points in my life, not knowing any better, I, I signed on to that term, that title somebody was throwing around only to find out later on they were POS. Okay, luckily I didn't let them lead me so far down the rabbit hole that I couldn't get out. But there's, you know, I've relinquished my critical thought in various periods of my life as we all have. But here I am telling you, don't do that if, if at all possible. Yeah, and, and I think just to kind of uh, make sure people understand what you're talking about here, th there's a lot of problems in the self-defense world from an industry point of view, and that a lot of the things that are being taught look great in the training environment, but they just don't translate well to the real world. Let me mention too, you mentioned CPL, that's Concealed Pistol License here in Michigan, and NRA National Rifle Association. And, you know, the I just so folks are, are, are following along with the phrases being used. But the idea here is there's a lot of stuff in the training world that is being offered as self-defense or, or topics related to self-defense that, frankly, are either don't apply much to the real world or can even cause you a lot of harm in the real world. And I think that's something you got to be really careful. And I want to I don't want to go off on a tangent here, Norris, but you bring up a really good point. Let me just say something, too. I'm going to try to set the screen. We're going to see how well this works out. I did it successfully one time. Let's see if I could do it again. All right. So when you go to this additional resources, the page I just took you to at livesafeacademy.com, online resources, and then additional resources. There's a video here. Don't talk to the police. Everybody needs to watch that video. If, if there's one thing that I could get everybody to do, and it was only one thing, watch that video. It's right there on our website. It's free of charge. And then here's the... Um, uh, here's the video with Lance Thomas. So I'm going to take you off the screen chair. I just wanted to point that out, but I, I think that's really critical. And let me mention too, because you brought this up when we, when we talk about law enforcement, law enforcement has a certain priority of jobs. And it looks like this. Number one, go home at the end of your shift with your health and your career. Now, it's not to be critical of police because everybody has this aspect of self-preservation as they should, because there's a lot of things you could die over and you never want to lose your life over something that's not worth losing your life over. So police have to protect themselves because it's a dangerous job. But going home at the end of their shift with their career and their health, it, it, you're protecting you is like way down here. OK, this is their number one job. Bottom line. Number two, when they show up to a scene is secure the scene. So we're at. Go home at the end of your shift with your health and your career. If you're at a scene, you secure the scene. And here's the last one now. This is the one you brought up. Secure evidence for possible prosecution. Gather evidence for possible prosecution. Do we fall under the umbrella of a possible prosecution? If you are at that scene, you are under the umbrella of a possible prosecution. And their job is to gather evidence for that possible prosecution. Not to help you. They're not personal representatives working for you. I'm not being critical of cops. I love cops. But I'm telling you, they're not there to represent you like an attorney does. They're there to gather evidence for possible prosecution. And you do fall under that umbrella, period. That's how it is. So everybody, watch that video, please. I think that video is really critical. And, and what I like to tell my students, and I know you, you are, um, you know, this is something you deal with in your classes too, is I like to use the fewest words principle. Use the fewest words that you can to paint the clearest picture of evidence. Be conceptual. Don't go into details. Not they did, I did. But say they tried to hurt me and I was forced to protect myself. Something along those lines. Fewest words possible. Paint the clearest picture of innocence. Be conceptual. Don't go into details. Now, I don't give legal counsel. I'm not qualified to do that. It's your responsibility to follow the law and to have your own counsel and follow their advice. But this is what I give as a general a recommendation when I'm teaching classes. And then the other thing I say is you want to, as quickly as possible, invoke the Fifth Amendment and get the protection of an attorney. Because what you want is one statement in writing. You never want to say something more than once, because no matter how hard you're trying to be factual and accurate, you can say the same thing twice 
and create a contradiction in those two statements. And you don't want that statement to be verbal because the police officer writing it down, although now we have body cams, they're not a transcription machine. So the way you're saying it isn't necessarily being fully conveyed on paper. Again, we have body cams now, but these are general concepts. But the other thing that you need to understand is you want to wait until you have had time to process what happened and wait until you're in the right frame of mind before you make that one statement in writing with your attorney in private. And you're not doing that to conceal something from the system. You're doing that to protect the accuracy of the one statement in writing that you're making. Because it's very easy under stress to say something that's not factually accurate, even though you're intending to tell the truth. And what did I say is the number one weapon in the legal system? That's not stated towards you, Norse, that's towards the audience. It's your credibility. And if you say anything that's not factually accurate with the other credible information that they have, you are now compromising your number one weapon in that legal system. And you talk to attorneys, attorneys have to deal with this all the time. They didn't do anything wrong, but they said something wrong. And they're going to pay for what they said, even though they didn't do anything wrong. Here's just a real quick classic example of this. If God forbid you have to shoot somebody in self-defense, one of the questions that are often asked is, how, how many times did, did you shoot your gun? People almost never get that answer accurate. Usually they say less shots than they actually fired. Not because they're lying, but just their, the rec their memory of the event is not accurate because of the stress that's involved. Well, as soon as you say, I fired two shots, but the factual you uh, fired five, now we have just compromised credibility, our number one weapon in the legal system. And that can trigger a further investigation that might not have happened if all of the other ducks are in order. Because again, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but what happens is the police are there, they gather evidence for possible prosecution, they put that together in a package that they send to the prosecutor. Then the prosecutor says they either come back with, they issue a warrant, or they don't. That's simple. You want to make sure whatever's in that packet doesn't trigger the prosecutor to issue a warrant. That, that's pretty much the math of what you're dealing with. So the point of that is use the fewest words possible to create, uh, create the clearest picture of innocence, be conceptual, don't go into details, invoke the Fifth Amendment as quickly as you can. To invoke the Fifth Amendment, you must clearly assert two things. I do not want to make a statement. I want to speak to an attorney. Unless you do both, I don't want to make a statement. I want to speak to an attorney. You have not invoked the Fifth Amendment. And then once you do that, shut up until you're safely in the bosom of your attorney. Period. I don't care what they say. You want a pack of gum? No, I'm good. Thanks. No, don't even say that. Just nothing. I ain't talking. This is nothing to talk about. You're going to make your statement, but you're going to make it in writing one statement when you're with your attorney. So you guys can sort it out to make sure that statement is factually accurate. You're protecting factual accuracy when you do that. You're not hiding something. There's a difference. Norris, do you have any one, one last thought you want to put out here real quick in a 30 second or less, or, or do you, do you want me to wrap things up? Uh, no, I'm good. You know, while you're talking, I was just sitting here thinking about a, a movie, one of my favorite movies, um, Training Day. Yeah. You know, my man, my man, you know, he talks about, hey, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Yeah. You know, it's chess and ain't checkers. Um, but aside from that, man, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um, you tell me. Well, then let me say this. I want to really thank you for coming out here and sharing your experience because it's these firsthand experiences that really help people, one, have a realistic understanding of how crimes take place. Because a lot of times what people believe is not how things actually happen. That's where you have those gaps in your knowledge where you can end up having problems. So we want to make sure that we understand how do these things really happen so we can be prepared for them. And, and you made a statement that I agree with 100% and I stress too, is that you want to be prepared for the full spectrum of events. Don't leave gaps. Gaps are where you have problems. But then the other thing I want to do is thank the listeners and everybody for giving us your time today so that we can hopefully, hopefully bring you that benefit that can help you, your loved ones, be safe. If you feel this information is helpful, you can help us, help you, 
and other people too, a couple of really simple ways. If you're watching this video on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell, like the video, share the video with others. If you're listening to our podcast, subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast, share the podcast with others. That gets us into the search engines, which can help us help other people too. And we're very grateful for that. The other thing though, is always go to the video description and the podcast description where you will have information there that's relevant to what we're discussing. I just mentioned a couple resources today that I will put in the video and podcast description. And then always click on the link livesafeacademy.com forward slash connect where you have access to all of our podcasts, our videos, our articles, our in-person classes in the Detroit, Michigan area. And again, we do travel. If you want us to come to you, I want us to come to you, we can do that. And then our live virtual programs that you can participate in from anywhere in the world. And you'll see a complete list there of all the different types of virtual classes that we offer, including a number of classes where we're featuring experts that are coming up here very shortly uh, based on the time that I'm filming this or recording this video, that'll all be in the video description in the podcast description. So viewers and listeners, thank you very much for your time. Norris, thank you very much for sharing your experience with everybody. I really appreciate it. I want everyone to have a great day and be safe. Peace.